From the HBA Podcast Studio in New York City, welcome to The Medium Rules. I'm Alan Baldishan. We, I can't remember the last time we've actually printed out a paper share certificate, but we're, all, we're using Carta. So I would imagine that this network effect also boxes out competitors. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's that, that, that's, why, that's why the network starts to converge upon itself. Everyone uses it for the yeah. benefit of themselves and someone else. It's like, what were some moments of we hit a wall? You know? One, one inflection point was we're selling software that's, that, that's working. Um, people in the network are starting to adopt it. Uh, but kind of what's next? You guys produced a fairly high profile study with respect to pay equity and gender. And that report was called the gap table, the play on the gap table, the gender gap table. That was done last year, uh, uh, picked up by a ton of publications, yes. a lot of buzz on it. Yes. Um, the results were, you know, as expected and equally shocking. So we just published kind of version two of that. So Tim Gunderson from Carta, uh, welcome to the Medium Rules. Um, you are my final guest for my final show of 2019. So uh, let me just take the opportunity uh, to thank all my guests from 2019. We had a great year. We had Gail Simmons on. Uh, we had Michael Rubenstein, CEO of AppNexus, which was a great show. If anyone uh, missed that, I'd recommend you go back and see it. Troy Young, president of Hearst Magazines. We had the folks from Swing Left on, so we did a little political chat earlier this year, getting ready for 2020. Um, we took apart the Amazon HQ2 pullout. So uh, we had a great year, and, and Tim, you're here to end it. We're going to have a conversation about Carta, which is a uh, very close to home and a platform that we use all the time in our venture practice. So um, Tim, delighted to welcome you to the HPA Podcast Studio. Um, you are Vice President Partnerships at Carta. Uh, Carta is the electronic cap table management software platform founded in 2014, uh, Carta was originally named eShares. We worked with Carta back when it was eShares. And uh, the company was founded with the deceptively simple objective of bringing the efficiency, liquidity, and transparency of the public capital markets to the cap tables of private companies, including both the issuance of securities as well as tracking the share register. Um, clearly, Carta has found its product market fit because the company has exploded you, I have a note here that says you have over 300,000 companies on your platform. Is that right? Okay. okay. What, what, where are we? About uh, 13,000 pay, okay. paying companies. So clearly, I had an extra yeah. zero there. We'll get there. Uh, that's still, yeah, you'll get there. Uh, 13,000 paying companies on the platform. Um, and in late 2018, uh, you guys did a round where you were valued at $1.7 billion, um, bringing your total financing to $448 million. So that's an incredible job of scaling. Um, why don't you just high level take us through the Carta platform? What 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 is it at its most sort of basic, and and what's the offering? So essentially, we're we're soft we're software platform. We're in the cloud. Uh, you log in through any browser, and we manage we manage equity tables, capitalization tables. So. Um, as people know, a cap table has a list of people and what they own and at what price. Um, uh, so that's, that's the core of what we do. Um, you know, the atomic unit of our system is the digital share certificate. Uh, and we'll probably get into this later, I'm sure, but um, the idea of having a paper certificate of a private company flying around the house or having someone vault it for you is kind of antiquated. And so um, if you can do that digitally and keep a register or a ledger of who owns what, it uh, makes life a lot, uh, a lot simpler. Um, so you think about one aspect is the, is the register or the, the list of owners in the company. Uh, the other side is we're an, we're an SEC registered transfer agent. So it's one thing to have a fancy list to log into. Uh, it's another to be able to, um, as a transfer agent, to move shares from point A to point B. Um, so again, we, we think of it as, as the ability to, to manage ownership and manage who owns what at the same time can we help companies transact and move shares around as being an SEC registered transfer agent? Um, it's interesting to note, while we sell directly to companies, um, investors are typically an entity that are on a cap table. A venture investor invests in a company. Uh, they're, they're one of the stakeholders that are managed on the cap table. And so 
uh, we sell to companies, uh, investors and venture funds are actually heavy users of our system because they're much like an employee. They log in and see all their investments in a portfolio view. So people do think of us as, you know, the company centric and we do very deeply care about entrepreneurs and founders and making their life easier um, by providing the software. But that we actually have a broader audience than just founders and entrepreneurs. So uh, again, I'll say it again, we are a general ownership register. Um, we can transact on the platform. Um, and then of course there's features we can get into, but we, um, when you have the stock table, the equity table, uh, we can do things like value common stock. So the four nine, a valuation is what is what's required when you, when, when you issue stock. Um, and so we're the nation's largest provider of four nine, a valuations now. Um, uh, we offer software workflows like scenario modeling. So when you're an entrepreneur and you're going to raise some cash, uh, you might be curious what that does to dilution. What does it do to your existing shareholders? How does that change? And so we have some nice in-app features that allow folks to model that out. Exit scenarios. If you're going to get purchased or bought um, uh, or potentially go public, uh, what does that look like at different, at different preferences, priorities, and payouts uh, and things like that? So... Um, that, that's essentially what it is. It, it's, it is, I think, kind of a complex um, specialty finance solution. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're, we're just trying to help people keep track of who owns what the company. So let me, let me drill down on a couple of things you said. Um, one is the SEC register transfer agent. What's involved in that compliance from your guys' perspective? What, what does it take and what does it allow you to do? Well, one, we're the custodian. So um, – uh, I'll tell a story at some point. Hopefully, you'll ask me about how it got started. But we we we're the custodian of the actual share certificate, and we create that digitally. Um, much like e-signature came about ten years ago, where you don't need to sign with a pen and paper; uh, you can sign with the click of a button. Uh, very similar. We now have the ability to. Um, create and issue certificates that were never on paper to begin with and keep them and vault them as the word as the custodian. And then to transfer agent, that allows us to basically transfer um, uh, uh, from you to me. Uh, if, if you're a seller and I'm a buyer, we are allowed to transfer that shares out of your name and into my name. And from a compliance perspective with the SEC, is there how regulate, in other words, to, to sort of qualify is there are there filings are there standards you have to meet are there how how what what's that just that compliance i'm not a compliant compliance expert just to be fair okay. but yeah we are it's um it's pretty arduous uh and we and we respect that quite a bit we okay. we were um we actually acquired our way into the space, so it's not something you build. Okay. Um, we acquired the Philadelphia Stock and Transfer Company, and then we, we, we obtained their licenses as a transfer agent. Okay, so you acquired into that. That's interesting. That's a great – So, and, and in terms of um, transacting on the platform, when you say transacting, are you guys running a secondary market where people buy and sell through you? Okay, so let's talk about that. What does that look like, and 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 when did that come about, where people could actually pay, buy, and sell? Yeah, so I, we, we've been doing that um, since we've become a transfer agent. I've been, it's been a couple of years now, um, and there's there's a pretty fragmented marketplace out there that does yeah. this. Uh, uh, the Nasdaq stock market got involved with second, second market, market back in the day, yeah. and so I think they rebranded that the Nasdaq private market. So we do a similar thing. There's also some smaller startups that, that do this, but um, essentially companies are staying private longer. Uh, there's tons of capital out there, and so uh, the pain and cost of going public um, is, 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 on staying private is resonating. So in order to do that, you need to provide liquidity, and that's really what this innovation, the, word, the space that we're in, is all about. You have to be able to unlock liquidity for private shareholders. So secondary transactions, tender offers, they've been happening quite a while. They're typically one-off events. Um, you know, they involve lawyers for sure. Uh, uh, it's it's fairly um, arduous process. It takes 20, 30 days. Um, at the end of the day, people are, ma are mailed paper certificates typically unless they use something like Carta. So, um, yeah, we, we, do, we do several of these uh, uh, a month. Um, and it's, it's – they've been done for quite a long time. But, again, with the capital markets and the economic uh, trends that are happening, uh, it appears to be um, more commonplace now. So it, presumably it's only with respect to shares of companies that are on the platform. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're not – it's not an open exchange where – not yet anyway. Okay. Um, and in terms of the investor community, 
uh, for sort of portfolio management or portfolio analysis. Is that a separate product that you guys have created? Yeah. So I alluded in the beginning, let's go into that a little bit because it is an interesting distinction. I mentioned yeah. the audiences. So yeah. we obviously sell direct to the founder entrepreneur. Um, what's interesting is, uh, and this is this gets into a little bit of our mission and, okay. and our, our um, kind of our, you said product market fit, but we're starting to converge the networks. Let me talk about that for a moment if Please. I might. Yeah. So if you think of, think of these three nodes and at least the equity network, you've got companies, You've got investors that invest in those companies. Then you have those investors, investors, limited partners that invest in the funds. These think about these as three nodes. So we started selling this cap table ownership software platform to companies. Well, what did they start doing with it? They started issuing stock and to investors. So investors would receive an, a VC would receive an email and say, "Oh, we have this fancy confetti that comes in. Say, hey, you know, congratulations, you've, you've been issued stock." So, so what does that investor do? Logs in and says, "Well, I can see I can see my holdings valuation. What's going on?" Perhaps we pull company financials in. If the company wants to share that with certain people, they can do that. So the investor and their next and their next entrepreneur that they that they fund, where do they tell that entrepreneur, hey, you should get on Carta because we just found out about it through this company. We use it. If you use it, I can log in and see company two, investment two, investment three, portfolio. With, I can do I can do the entire portfolio and have insights and intelligence into that. So then, what does that company do? Well, that sounds great. That company goes out and fundraises and gets investor three. Hey, investor three, they see the confetti email. Congratulations, you've been issued shares. So you get the idea. So that's company to investor node. Investor, the next node, which we're early. This one, we're, you know, for lack of a better word, we're kind of, we're converging that market. You're involved in our in, in the work we do. I mean, we are we are taking that down for lack of a better word. Um, uh, but the next node is investors to limited partners. So what do limited partners see? The same kind of thing. Investors say, hey, limited, limited partners, here's your investment in fund one or fund two. Limited partners look at oh, wow, that's really convenient. And, and limited partners go and invest in another fund. Hey, you should use. So this is what happens when you have a true network effect. Wow. I was a DocuSign prior. You can imagine when you send someone like to sign, they say, wow, that's so easy. I'm never using a pen or paper again. And it's all, it's all collated and organized in a file. I'm going to send my next thing. So you get this thing. And we've seen that happen at the first two nodes. And this third node is just starting to take off too. Does that make sense? That's a great explanation. Um, and is that, is that, that network effect, is that responsible for, the, for, for how quickly you guys have scaled? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I think you know, you see the, the term product market fit is probably used far too much, but um, absolutely our growth, uh, our hyper growth has been because it's really product market fit. And then the network sees that and says, wow, the example I just gave you, it, it solves so many pain points, I'm going to use it. And then I'm going to use it for you and you're going to use it for me. And so that's, that's what's happened. It's spiraled out of control. Well, I, I'd love to come back to that. that. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to come back to that a little bit because, you know, well, let's let's stay on that for, for, for a moment because at this point, um, you know, candidly in our practice, we pretty much, I wouldn't say require because in the end we can't force a company to go on Carta, but we strongly encourage it. And we don't really think about any other software platforms. It's a little bit like DocuSign. Um you know, they've really, really controlled that market. And at this point, you just, you almost can't do a closing with uh, scanning signature pages. I mean, we've gone from, just to stay on, 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 on my world for a minute, we've gone from paper closing tables, you know, when I first started out, to everything done, you know, through email and, and scan signature pages to now DocuSign. Um, you know, I, I really don't do, we don't do any closings that don't involve DocuSign. Similarly, we, I, I can't remember the last time we've actually printed out a paper share certificate, but we're all, we're using Carta. So I would imagine that this network effect also boxes out competitors. For sure. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, that, that, that's why, that's why the network starts to converge upon itself. Everyone uses it for the yeah. benefit of themselves and someone else. Particularly at the invest, at those two upper level nodes, because, you know, if you're a company, you're like, well, this and this, I'll compare the pricing. But from a fund's perspective or an LP's perspective, they don't want to have to try and merge. They're seeing all their companies on one platform. Carta seems to be where that's landed. That puts you guys in a great position. Yeah, we, I, I had a, a, a venture partner of ours uh, comment to me. Uh, I'll probably screw this up, but it was something on the lines of, um, the only thing worse than having my portfolio companies and founders um, not using software or automation is having them on three different systems. So again, going back to the, the network effect, 
Uh, and again, I forget the definition of a network, but it's like the telephone, right? When, when there's one telephone, not very valuable. When you got one, a little more valuable. When our family got one, more valuable. When when companies use the cap table, pretty valuable. When venture investors use the cap, they're on the cap table and they use it for other investments, very valuable. When the limited partners that are in the venture funds use it, and you get the idea. I mean, we're talking about this network thing. It's, it's, it's happening. That's a great lesson for founders and early stage investors is identifying those areas where you can really leverage those network effects. And it sounds like a cliche, but this is a great, great illustration of that. And you've done a great job describing it. It's very insightful. Um, can you give us a little bit about, I know you, you, you weren't there at the beginning yeah. with Henry, and, but can you give us a little bit about the origin story? I, I, let me just quickly, anecdotally, um, I, had a, uh, I had a lawyer turned entrepreneur come into the office about eight years ago and pitch us on beta testing software for um, our trademark practice. And it was clunky without, you know, it, we, it wasn't that interesting to us. What I said to the guy was, you want something you can take down? Figure out cap table management for, 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 for startups and for venture lawyers. That is the thing that causes me the most pain because lawyers were keeping track of the, were expected to keep track of these cap tables. And it wasn't something we did. It wasn't something we wanted to do. And so you guys figured this out. And it has taken off. So how did that, how did you guys sort of get to that? How, how was it sort of landed on? Um, and, uh, you know, give me the first sort of the, the, the germination of, of, of what was eShares that's now Carta. So obviously I wasn't there. Right. Um, and it was, it was 20, it was 2012, actually. Um, so here, here's kind of the, here are the details that I'm aware of as, as the story goes. Sure. Um, Henry Ward, our, our CEO and, and, and co-founder, he was, um, he'd secured an investor, uh, a gentleman named Manu Kumar from K9 Ventures, and for a, an idea prior to eShares or now Carta. And they were in a Thai restaurant, I think in uh, somewhere on the, in Palo Alto, it's in the Bay Area. And they were talking about that venture. Um, and I don't believe it was doing too well. And, you know, it was, it was a concept more or less. But... Uh, Manu was the one that said, hey, uh, as an investor, uh, w- you know, Henry, what are your thoughts on these paper certificates? This is ridiculous. What, 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 you know, what do I do with them? If I lose them, I have to call lawyers, the founders. I'm going to invest in your thing that you're doing now. Uh, you know, it, this seems really stupid. Uh, and Henry, he, he actually has an uh, advanced degree in capital markets finance, so he knows, he knows the inner workings of, of, of market structure and the like. And he sat there and, you know, I, I think he says it just struck him. You know, he's like, well, whether I do this idea or the next idea, they're all going to have the same problem of what you just said. Let's go do it. And so Men is a co-founder also. Uh, okay. and I'll, and is, I'll, he, uh, is he uh, full-time operational there? No, okay. he, he's just been an investor. Okay. Yeah. Henry from day one has, has run the company. Okay. And what were their fir- – do you happen to know, Tim, and you may not um, – were they – they attacked the company note first, and, and was it principally through – Lawyers. So it's interesting. So I mentioned before we 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 or Henry and the early team made a deliberate attempt and effort to sell direct to the customer, the entrepreneur. Um, at the time, um, there's not much competition in this space, but there are a few players out there. Um, one of the competitors made a decision to sell directly to folks like you to the law firms. You buy an enterprise license um, for a similar cap table type software, and then you can go distribute that. You can charge for it. You can waive the fees, defer the fees, do your thing. Um, I don't love selling to law firms. No offense. I don't love selling to No, it's, it's such a great distinct. I, I want to drill down on this because selling to law firms is a nightmare. Awful. Yeah. So, no offense. It's just a— it's no, a not, not, not taken. It's, it's, we'll get into it. But, yeah, because there's a whole legal tech discussion that—, that, that um, um, so anyway, so the, the decision was, let's go make life easier. And again, at the Thai restaurant, it was like, you know, you're going to have to, whatever idea you do that I back, Henry, you're going to have the same problem. So let's go solve this for all the Henrys out there that are, that are coming up with ideas. So it made sense. It had scale. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a weird kind of strange problem to solve. So um, yeah, so they, 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 they started selling, I think the 2014 is when they started selling. I think that's the date we started selling. Um, but we started going direct to companies and founders and said, hey, this is important. Um, and again, at the same time, while we had just early on in that, in that note, if you will, of companies, very quickly on, folks like Manu were saying, as an investor, I want all my companies on here. It solves my problem too. So we didn't have to build the network. It was sitting there waiting to kind of, kind of to converge upon itself. You know what's, what's uh, smart about that is, you know, 
you go sell to law firms, law firms now looking at their IT budget, you know, which, you know, for big law firms is big, for medium sized law firms is big. No one's looking to increase that budget. And for, you know, the big national venture firms, there's a lot of bureaucracy to go through, there's a lot of adoption. The selling directly to entrepreneurs, you're basically getting them pretty much after a funding event. So they've just raised money. And I know you guys uh, have a program for uh, companies, funded companies, less than 500000 where you waive, which is also smart. But here you are. You're basically selling to companies right after they've been funded, making their life easier. It's really not a lot of money versus asking the law firm to buy a piece of software, which they're already doing it. They're not going to spend that money. So that is interesting that you went because – you, you basically got a ready market there. They've got the money. It's just a cost of doing business. They know they're going to have to pay lawyers. This is actually going to save them money because let's face it, lawyers, the time involved in preparing and keeping cap tables and moving things around, not to mention how much it costs if that goes sideways, which it often does through the no fault of anyone's. It's just there's a lot of paper. It's not followed up on signature pay here. And actually, one thing we should note with Carta is you can't get your share certificate, your electronic share certificate, if you haven't signed all the documents, accepted, if all the information is not in the system, you're not getting your share certificate. So it's an incredible pull to get people to do what they're supposed to be doing. And that end thing is that confetti moment. But everything that's gone into that sets the table for a clean, up-to-date share register, and then off you go. And it's really relatively inexpensive. And you're right, you're getting companies when they've been funded. Right. And, I'll, and I'll mention, you know, even though we sold direct to the, uh, the entrepreneur, the founder of the company, we knew early on that folks like you and the legal community were critically important. And so th we've always had the idea of this kind of love triangle, right? We're manufacturing the software, um, we're selling it and contracting to the end user, but our power users typically are folks like you and paralegals that are in the legal community. They're the ones that are drafting. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stock grants and the like. And so um, that's been an in interesting tug for us throughout the year. I've been here um, just about a year and a quarter. Um, part of my mandate was to come in and, and figure out um, how do we really work better with law firms? Uh, I can, you, can, you, can, you can search out of the gate, Henry, as any entrepreneur would do, trying to crack into a new market and get something going. Um, initial messaging was just that, save on legal fees. Um, that, that doesn't resonate great with folks like you. Um, I think forward thinking people in professional services know that you need to be tech enabled and that's probably a good message and you probably want to charge for higher margin services that you do, transactional stuff. You probably don't want to charge entrepreneurs nickel and dime them for doing uh, you know, uh, data input. So I, I think there was a common ground out of the gate. Um, there certainly was some consternation between um, law firms and, and, and the early team at eShares and Carta. We've come a long way just in the last two years on kind of figuring out how to work together. Well, I'll also say your customer service team's great. So you guys have built a great organization that's easy to work with from the perspective of uh, venture, the venture legal community. So that, that shouldn't go unnoticed. I mean, it's not a 1-800 number and you're, not, you're getting somebody in person. I've spent a lot of time personally on the phone with people at Carta. Um, and uh, we look at it every day for all the companies we have on the platform, and it works great, I will say. I mean, I'm not <laughs> – you know, you'll, you'll give me the, the big check after, but uh, no, it does. Um, what um, – so in terms of getting those companies on the platform, was it door-to-door? -door? Was it going to – do you happen to know that initial sort of sales strategy? Was it social media? Was it – Again, going to conferences, was it lawyer, sort of getting the lawyer, legal community educated to then put their – how did that – how did it kind of gain momentum in that first couple of years? Obviously, at the time, there wasn't a full-fledged go-to-market revenue team. At the same time, you know, uh, um, enterprise software companies kind of have three – there's three There's three buckets or levers of how they get demand or, or, or custom, you know, future customer prospect interest. One is obviously sales team just calling people, right? You can, you can, Your typical you know, SaaS sales engine. inside sales, yeah. there, there were definitely early sales people. Henry's one of the best actually, uh, not shocking, but, um, early sales folks, they were calling, um, they were calling companies that, that, that people knew about, right? I mean, fundraising is public. You can, you can subscribe to, um, data sources that, that, um, that, that, you know, they tell you who raised around. 
So certainly um, the sales the sales motion was obviously from day one always was there. Um, marketing, uh, yeah, I think there was there's generally there was kind of air cover that we received when we when he started this about some kind of um, awareness and PR stuff that was happening. Probably not a full fledged marketing engine per se as, as we would think of one now enterprise company and what we have going on now. Yeah. But um, there was definitely kind of the search engine optimization stuff going on. Um, Henry was early, and he still is an a- um, uh, an avid writer and blogger on all things equity. Um, so that was kind of the marketing um, bucket. And, and the third lever is partnerships. It's what I do for a living. Yes, we were talking to law firms and investors, anyone that influences the capital mark, kind of private capital market ecosystem, auditors, lawyers, consultants, uh, outside accounting firm, that kind of stuff. Um, we were talking to them, saying, "Hey." your clients could use this. And by the way, it will help you do your job better. So again, the three main buckets of demand for software companies, they all exist today. Um, you know, if you do some marketing and, and some PR, you could get some inbound interest, you know, sales folks calling and doing some targeted sales calls. And then you have this kind of building a channel up of partners that will, that will send you referrals. Um, those are all, you know, well-oiled machines now and cranking. Early on, you can imagine they were just kind of the, 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 the early starting points for all those. What does the sales team look like now? Um, it's, it's, uh, it looks like a typical enterprise sales team. We have, um, uh, I'm not sure. Do you have a CRO? We don't. Okay. Um, uh, we have, but we have, uh, executive sales, a couple of executive sales leaders, um, that have been in enterprise sales like myself for, you know, for decade plus. Uh, but the sales team is simple. You know, we segment by, um, by kind of size of company. So you have, you know, early, early kind of newly formed companies it's in software. You call those small to medium sized business SMB you hear a lot. Uh, we have a mid-market segment, which is, um, you know, maybe series uh, B, C, yeah, somewhere in there. And then we have kind of the the enterprise. Um, for us, you know, enterprise and software typically would mean kind of Fortune Fortune 5000. For us, it means late stage, um, think unicorn type type companies. Like Carta. <laughs> you eat the dog food. Um, what, um, if you can, and, 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 you know, based on your own experience and, and maybe just sort of being around the company, what, what can you describe sort of some of the inflection points for in scaling, whether it was technological, whether it was team, whether it was market adoption and, and, and how did you guys overcome those? Like what were some moments of we hit a wall? Yeah. So I think one moment was the, um, we, 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 we'd begun kind of selling the cap table to companies and it was clear, as you said, that they need this when they, when they, fundraise initially and per regulation they need they need to have a uh, uh the strike price of their the fair market value of their comments 409a yeah 409a yeah. Yeah. yeah which is let me just pause and explain just very quickly that is a tax rule uh which basically says that options can't be issued with an exercise price less than fair market value and this arose really in connection with steve jobs backdating options back way back about 10 12 years ago um and in order to be compliant with that rule, you need a independent appraisal of that fair market value. This is called Rule 409A. So it's we call it a 409A valuation or appraisal, and you need an independent appraiser um, to perform that. So that's the right. yeah. that's exactly right. And yeah. so um, one one inflection point was we're selling software that's that, that's working. Um, people in the network are starting to adopt it, uh, but kind of what's next, right? We, um, and so they need this this service and so i I believe we'd partner with some with some providers and i think um quickly henry and the team realized to do a a foreign evaluation the primary thing you need is the cap table who's on it what they pay to get on it and then after that it's just kind of some high school math so we got in the business of 49As. Um, and this is something we should probably get into because it's, it's one of Henry's uh, very successful plays in his playbook is 49A was a very fragmented industry. You had these niche these niche providers that, that, that did these valuations and they charged five, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a time uh, per report. And they're not that difficult to do. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of models you use and then it's, and there's a little bit of art to it, but not a ton. Um, there shouldn't be that much, frankly. Uh, and so... Because these companies just aren't that complex. Not that we're, we're not at, at early stage. There, you know, it's it's there's some convertible debt maybe. There's, a, and there's what you've raised and what price you've raised at and how much you've raised. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think you know it, it, these these valuation reports need to be audit defensible. So you, you know, there's probably a time when everyone just wanted a bunch of cheap stock. Um, you can't do that. 
Um, but essentially, uh, again, it's a longer story, but but we saw we saw that these companies needed the software, but immediately when they bought the software, they were at that the company was at the point where they were fundraising. They needed a 409A like yesterday because they're in the middle of fundraising. So um, we um, we acquired Silicon Valley Bank Analytics, which was their valuations team, and we acquired them, brought them in, and that was a couple of years ago. And since then, we've taken this professional service. And we've tech enabled it and we've automated it. Now you still have to have humans, but um, you don't have to have an army uh, of folks to, to, you know, to do this. And you'll see um, we're already doing this, but our turnaround time on foreign valuations is, you know, a day. That's incredible. Because so, really you've taken that down from four weeks, less than like two, three years ago. And you're right. Our companies were paying four, five, six thousand dollars a pop. And it was just it just felt like. You know, paying the piper. You you really were not getting value out of that, but you had to do it. So it was very captive. Um, We had we had a couple providers we use now. Everyone uses Carta. That's right. So and just to that point. So when we did that, what happens? Well, you start to sell them separately, and you figure out your pricing, and you go to market, and it's it's really the companies when they need Carta, they need the four nine A. So just should probably put it together. And when we did that, we pretty much put most four nine A niche providers. You know, out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's been incredibly successful. Um, And what's been, what's beneficial is the 49A, I believe it's, once you do one, I believe it's mandated, you have to kind of do one and refresh it every year. So that's interesting because when you're in the software, the software is a service business model that you got like a built in recurring model kind of per regulatory order, which is nice. Not Not bad. bad. (laughs) Not a bad way to go. Um, Personally, how did you, what's your sort of, career journey to get to Carta. Yeah, it's not that exciting. Um, so uh, the don't, short, don't undersell yeah, it. Come sure. on, Tim. Uh, the short of it is I spent seven plus years at the NASDAQ stock market. I was I worked at the exchange. Um, and in, in tech? Yeah, so I, the exchange is I have a couple of different business lines. I worked in their issuer services, basically working with companies that are public or want to be public. Um, it's actually kind of a strange role to be honest with you, but, uh, you know, you, I was in my late twenties and I was in front of board of directors and, um, you know, you know, uh, very well-known entrepreneur. So it was a wonderful experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, my mom thought I was a stockbroker at the time. She didn't quite grasp what I was doing, but, um, okay. the, the point is, is it was a very, um, influential job in my career for me. During, during the exchange, during that business, I would meet a bunch of, I mentioned CEOs and founders, and one of them said, hey, you should get into software. So I jumped and I just made the jump from the exchange business and jumped into a software company, very successful a company called NetSuite. Uh, they do kind of this kind of, the, it was the online version of QuickBooks back in the day. Uh, I went to NetSuite, then I went to DocuSign. So I, two or three of these enterprise software companies. So when an executive at Carta found me maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, said, hey, we love your capital markets business and your enterprise software business. We're kind of doing something similar here. We have this enterprise software, but we're also rebuilding some, pl- trying to think about rebuilding plumbing for the capital markets. It's very interesting. Um, and his quote was, and I, his quote, I have in an email was like, you know, you're, uh, you, you know, you, <laughs> something around my, you know, my destiny was to come work for Carta. Um, it's a hell of a sales pitch. I'm here obviously. But um, so that, that's what it boils down to. I think, you know, and I've hired, a, I've hired a, a fair amount of people in the last year and a half since I've been there, a year and a quarter. It is tough. You know, you kind of oscillate between capital markets people, um, relationship bankers, and and software folks. And, and there are there are hybrids, but um, not super easy to find. Right. Um, prior to that, again, a lot of de- I'm older than just those than just those two stints in software and uh, in the in the market. But I was I was an analyst for a while, um, investment banking analyst for a brief stint, and didn't want to work 100 hours a week and do high school math, so I, I stopped doing that. <laughs> it's a nice way to capsulize uh, banking, um, but I don't disagree. Um, and you, in terms of partnerships at Carta, are you selling? Is it a biz dev role? And, and maybe talk a little bit about what kind of partnerships you guys are thinking of. Is that is that M and A or is that maybe just yeah. get into that a little bit? For sure. So yeah, you know, um, in software, there's partnerships, business development, alliances, strategic alliances, channel. All these terms are thrown around in circles. Um, yeah, w- what my teams and, and, and my mandate is is to go work with folks that influence our potential customers and our current customers. So law firms are a, are a great example. You, you, you folks are in touch with our current customers. You're in touch with our potential future customers. How do we work with you? Um, I mentioned venture investors, another great uh, place. Um, uh, audit, audit firms, consultants, um, 
you know, uh, there's a bunch, there's a huge community of kind of outsourced CFOs. You know, you don't, you don't need to hire an entire back office until you get to some 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 level of scale. Those folks have a ton of influence working with founders and entrepreneurs. So, um, those are the partner types. Our go to market with those partners is very simple. It's, it's a referral program. As you know, you, you you send business to us. Some partners want to get paid. Most law firms don't want to get paid. You just care about. You can't. Yes, you can. I don't think you. I mean, I I yeah. I don't yeah. No, Under don't the professional that. rules, you can't take. A- so. All you care about, I'm guessing, you can tell me if I'm wrong, is you want your client to be taken care of. Um, and you want to maintain some control, I think, too, of the, of the relationship, which, which is fair. And so um, the referral program is just that. We, you know, we accept referrals. We actually give out a lot of referrals, too. So you can imagine that 13,000 customers, fast-growing customers at all stages, they look to us for help. Yeah. I need a law firm from this. I need, uh, I'm searching for a CFO or for a CMO. Um, trying to diversify my board. Uh, you know, they, they come to us with all kinds of, I need, I need software to run HR payroll. And so we have this uh, uh, channel of customers and a, distribution, and a distribution arm to them with the Salesforce and my team. So partnerships, just to be clear, is it's folks that can send us business and we can send business back to them. It's on a referral nature. Um, you, could env- you could envision the future. We might open up a reseller channel perhaps. Um, you know, there could be uh, professional employee organizations that, that are kind of outsourced HR companies for fast growth companies. They offer not only the service, but they offer the service on top of a platform, typically payroll and benefits. You could envision maybe those folks offering Carta um, in, as, part of their, as part of their bundle. Or the accounting software, I would Accounting call software, yeah. exactly. The QuickBooks. Yeah. The, yeah peach trees. Are the- That's right. Yeah. yeah. The, the, there's not, the, the good thing is um, I've, worked, I've worked with pure platform companies that are, that are you know, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep, and they, they require an ecosystem. Think of Salesforce's App Exchange and the like. They they they, they you know they, they require on every sale typically a, a uh, integration partner to take them into an industry or, or to actually customize the, the solution. Um, we're we're like a mile deep. I mean, our, and we have a long ways to go still. It's a pretty it's a pretty deep ocean, but um, we don't need a lot of extensions. Probably um, there are two obvious use cases. HR is an obvious one. We can get into that. It's a um, you know, we will partner with HR firms uh, in short order. Um, I'll just give you, an, I'll give you a use case because people, people can kind of see how it works. Uh, I get hired at a firm. Um, HR knows first typically when they create the Tim Gunderson profile in the HR system of record. Then someone has to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully be granted um, stock options. I took the job. Someone has to go into Carta and draft those. So there, 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 we, we can eliminate some of that double entry. If an HR system says Tim was hired, they could, they could programmatically potentially call Carter and say, Tim's a new employee. Um, at least I go in there and want, you know, once a day and see the queue of new employees to go create and draft. Or maybe it's actually sophisticated enough where it just, it just creates, it creates Tim Gunnerson under the company account that's already in Carter. It just, it's, it's an efficiency play. That's an obvious one. Um, there's also stuff we can get from from payroll companies, right? We have to think, we have to help our participants, our employees, when they exercise options, think about tax consequences. Yes. And um, payroll systems have the tax withholding elections, W4s and the like. If we could put together a partnership, that would help us. Um, if I exercise some some. That's a big pain point. If I, exercise, yeah, if, I, if, I, if I exercise stock, maybe I shouldn't go buy a Ferrari tomorrow. You know, yeah. you know, maybe Carter should say, "Hey, we're not tax advisors, but based on what we know, you might want to consider putting aside." X number of dollars yeah, because you know AMT. That's a very IRS is going to become calling, right. and so that's a very interesting. I think. And then and the ISO no so the non qual complexity for employees who most of the time don't really even really realize what's going on. Yeah. So I mean, we, we hopefully we've learned. I mean, there were employees back in the in the in, in the in the the bubble and bust that got literally turned upside down because they, they had no idea that the AMT was gonna was really gonna crush so, them. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's really interesting. Um, you know, in terms of, has it ever, has it ever occurred to try and tie in boards for option grants, company boards to try and get that approval process streamlined? So we, we have a feature that's basically called board consents. We believe that, um, so we actually have a board management product, but, but, but the, it's really, it's really, um, to allow, board members, it's to allow, um, to send out consents on new stock option grants and allow board members to, to click through right. and take care of that business, maybe prior to a board meeting. Um, so we have that product now. Um, How, when did that get rolled out? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, we've had it for a while. I haven't but, seen that. Yeah. So what we should definitely, that, that, that's on my team. We'll, you know, we'll, yeah. Well, 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 we'll, we'll talk. We'll yeah. talk. Yeah. 
Cause that we, we'd use that all the time. Yeah. So we, we would love your feedback on that. We, yeah. We've put a ton of, a ton of new development effort into that. Um, it needed some work and it probably needs a little more work to, okay. to, to be honest, but okay. it's out there. It's being used. We talk about the network. We think board member. I mean, the ob- right. right. Exactly. I don't have to explain that. Well, they're also, they're also venture guys there. That's a huge referral. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Hire me at Carta. I'm getting full of ideas here. <laughs> all ones you've already thought of as it turns out. Um, well, we, we, I was going to ask you a little bit about features, but um, talk a little bit about um, maybe some additional markets that you guys are sort of thinking about maybe getting into. What, 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 just give me a little bit of the, to the extent you can talk about it, a little bit of the future um, and, and how you see the world for Carta in the next two or three years. So I'll start kind of really high level. Um, you know, uh, we're working with the regulators. We're, you know, we're, we're a FINRA member, an SIPC uh, member. Um, obviously, we're a transfer agent uh, with, with the SEC. So we're working with them because, you know, the overall innovation um, in this space, and even capital markets in gen- private capital markets in general, is going to be around unlocking liquidity for private shareholders. Employees, venture investors, whoever it might be, companies are staying private longer, raising boatloads of cash. Um, you have to provide... You have to you have to be able to unlock people and let them re- realize their value. So, um, you know that it's that's it's probably all I can kind of say around that. But okay. the, the innovation's coming around that area. You, you have to be able to, to to unlock this and allow people to realize the value. Let me ask you this, Tim. Uh, uh, where do you see opportunities uh, and liquidity? At what level of is it is it sort of valuation driven? Companies above let's say 500 million have an opportunity to really sort of have some liquidity or do you even go down earlier down the, 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 the ecosystem um, or the valuation curve? I don't know if there's a, a profile on that. Certainly, um, here's what I would say. Com- I would say it might be more time-based. Companies that have been, okay. ar- companies that have been around right. longer, your initial employees are there. Um, you know, I was at DocuSign for a couple of years, and the initial employees had been there for 11 years. It's asking a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, I don't know if there's a typical profile, but I, I think the longer companies are private, uh, the more pressure. The more pressure, up. and you, you need you need again the innovation. Gonna- and you have buyers who want those shares. Right. We yeah. we, we have both sides, and yeah. so um, there has to be a way. Again, back. To- no, no one's cracked this. No. It's amazing. People are trying. Yeah. Um, and I think if you think about people that might crack that, you, you know, we've started by aggregating all of the uh, companies and cap tables that are growing fast. And so we have the, the atomic unit, again, is we have the, we know who holds the share certificate. We have that. And so any transaction you do, that has to move from point A to point B, sell it a buyer. So, you know, we feel like we're in a pretty good position to think about how to, how to, um, how to approach that. And we're obviously thinking about it. You know, because you know, just as anecdotally, again, I've got shares in a unicorn company that I've, I invested in in 2011 and have had no opportunity to get liquidity, would love it, and it's just not there. You know, and that, that uh, never mind the employees who have been there even longer. Um, do you guys, which, which leads me to another question, do you guys, is it right now principally, if not only, U.S. companies on the platform? What about, let's say, the Israeli startup ecosystem or European companies or Canadian companies? Where is it, Give me a little bit of that international picture. It's, it's predominantly U.S. companies. Um, and again, as I started out and kind of described the, the platforms that exist today, we have the ledger, which is a very nice user interface, super organized, and then we have the ability, and then we're a uh, registered transfer agent, so we have international customers, and they and they buy our solution to use the register, the, the the ledger. Anyone can can use that. The concept of being a transfer agent in different jurisdictions is different in every jurisdiction. So, transfer agent that concept in other countries is com- is completely different. So we'll have to go knock those down. Right. But to be clear, we we do. I mean, there is a ton of value that that second kind of transfer agent transaction thing aside. There is a lot of value and getting off of napkins or Excel spreadsheets and getting into Carta. Again, I don't have to sell the value of the cloud. You can access any place, any time, any device. That's all there, super organized, um, audit trail. Uh, so we do have companies that pay us for that. They just, we just can't act, we can't act as the transfer agent equivalent. Okay, okay. So eventually you'll, 
set up a set up shop in Tel Aviv and figure that out or London or yeah. And you got to keep in mind with the network that the, the I, I think you know well, I don't think I know we're pretty unique in the United States with our our venture ecosystem. It's a little different in different in different areas, right? I mean, in Europe, you've got more of these corporate VCs. You hear a lot about corporate strategic investments, yeah. and so we'll have to think about how we approach. It's different. You're right. It's a different market. It's, it's different mindset. It's more of a kind of a top down versus kind of this entrepreneurial bottom up. That's, right. that's a broad brush stroke, but that's yeah. that's no, no, it's I different. Right. I think you're right. Um, I read in doing a little bit of background research for, for this interview that um, there is some talk of, or there, there are companies that even when they go public, they stay on Carta. What is the benefit there? So, in, in the world of 10 Qs, 10, you know, 10 Ks, investor, you know. So, um, you know, w w uh, w when you go public, your, the cap table kind of goes away, as you know it, and it goes yeah. to that there's this very antiquated infrastructure, the depository trust and clearing company, all that madness that happens in your brokerage accounts. So um, I guess I'll say, you know, we, we, we have public companies on our, on our platform. Uh, we, we support them. They're typically less complex companies um, where their employee stock plans are, 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 are simpler than a um, widely traded, yeah. right, yeah. Um, you know, we, I mentioned we're a, we're a recurring business model type company, a software as a service. So um, we, we absolutely are going to build out our support to keep our companies on the platform. That business model breaks pretty quickly when people leave. You, they don't pay you anymore. And so we absolutely are building that. And again, we already support our, we already support um, a certain profile of public company on the platform that's complex. Um, so this is something that's a little bit skunk works that you guys are working on. Like I said, we, we have to be able to we have to be able to keep our customers happy and to keep them on the platform. Okay. Um, just sort of winding w winding down a little bit. Um, you guys produced a fairly high profile study with respect to pay equity and gender, um, and and in specifically related to equity based comp and and how much equity female founders had versus male founders and female uh, C-suite executives and startups versus males. Interesting. What what was the reaction to that generally? What sort of motivated that? Did that happen by accident? Um, do, do you, Have you seen any any sort of benefits from that? Can you talk a little bit about that? For sure. Uh, yeah. So before I get into this, I'll say if you think about our 13,000 companies and the individual cap tables of those companies um, and then the individual entities, employees, and investors on that, we have a treasure trove of information. And it's our customers' data. We, op we operate the service. They own the data. But in aggregate, we can do some really interesting things. And so um, and I, I would say we are early, early on in kind of our data science. But, um, I mean, um, imagine the queries you could query in aggregate uh, our platform. You could you could query the platform and say, what's the average uh, equity grant to your first uh, engineering hire? I mean, incredibly powerful things we could do. We haven't started that yet. One of the but along that same vein, um, in 2018, so last year, uh, we partnered with Hashtag Angels. Um, there, it's a female investment collective um, out of the Bay Area, prominent, I believe, and um, they are. Um, I don't know if it's their mission or mandate, but they, they have a, a tremendous focus on empowering women and also underrepresented minorities groups. Um, but we partnered with them on, on this project to figure out, can our data tell us something? We have a ton of data, as I already mentioned. And that report was called the gap table, the play on the gap table, the gender gap table. That was done last year. Uh, uh, picked up by a ton of publications, a lot of buzz on it. Um, the results were, you know, as expected and equally shocking. So we just published kind of version two of that. Um, and this one was much deeper. This was called Table Stakes. I, and I won't do the, the report is incredibly deep. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll plug it. Tablestakes.com is the plug. Uh, the entire report's on the website uh, with visuals and graphs. Um, but I'll give you a few snippets of this. And again, it's, it's, not, it's not surprising. It's just shocking. Um, we found, so in the Table Stakes study, we found from a founder perspective, uh, women founders, uh, own 5% of the equity value. Men founders own 64% of the equity value. 
<laughs> now, now oh we can agree there's variables around, uh, you know, uh, sample size and whatnot. But put all that aside, it's outrageous. Um, how is that? Did you guys draw any kind of causative, you know, predicates here? I mean, I'll get to that in a minute. But I mean, okay. I, I, okay. I, I think that there's, you know, it's not just issuing share. You, you know, um, perceptions have to change. Act, people have to act differently. From employees, from from women underrepresented groups themselves, to companies hiring hiring managers, to investors, people have, the whole supply chain of this in this ecosystem has to change. So um, that that was a founder stat. The other stat was just fem, uh, women employees in general. So all women employees in our sample size. By the way, the sample size was about ten thousand of our companies. Again, it's all on the website table stakes. But ten thousand companies, uh, twenty five thousand founders. Um, I want to say. 300,000 employees. So it was a very, no very fluke here. In these no, we're not cherry picking a couple of no, them. No, no, um, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, women employees own 49 cents to every, to the, on the dollar that a man owns in equity. Half, less, than less than half. half. I mean, yeah. ha- it's, you can't even say half. It's literally less than half. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got two daughters that I'm, you know, I'm raising with my wife and it's, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, I don't, it's, it's, yeah. it's shocking. Um, so to, to your question, you know, I don't know if we have the answer. I can tell you, Henry and our exec team um, and the company as a whole, we are absolutely um, devoted to, to, to kind of shining a light on this, to highlighting this, um, and to doing what we can as a company. Again, it's going to take this, this behavioral change. Is take, it's going to take a very, social change. It's going to take a very long time. But we'll say, you know, the plug is if you are an underrepresented minority or, 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 um, or a woman specifically, ask for equity. Negotiate. People don't, I mean, men, a lot, most candidates don't do that, but women especially, ask for it. It's your right. Most companies, most of them won't rescind the offer, and I think probably all of them expect you to. Ask for what you deserve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from, from, a hiring, right. from a hiring standpoint, don't pay people what, what you think the job rec pays them. Pay people for their value, right? And then from an investor standpoint, I think in California, you might know this better than I, I believe there's a law that public companies at some point in the future, if not now, have to have one um, unrepresented minority on the board. I believe that's a law. I could be wrong, but I believe it's a law for public companies. So investors, when you're looking for entrepreneurs and funding, as an investor, take the responsibility to ask the question, how do you think about diversity in your organization? Do you care about it or not? So again, I... Yeah. Um, very interesting on the data, though. You could also um, you you could also imagine predictive analytics with respect to which startups perform better and why, based on some cap table factors. I mean, there's a lot of other factors, market size, um, experience of founders, etc. But my guess is your option program and and how you build the company and how much money you take on and when has something to do with it. So you, you could imagine you could imagine some very rich sort of predictive models coming out of your data. I'm incredibly excited about that. Actually, yeah. we have a data science team that's uh, that, that's, you know, whip, whip smart. And yeah, um, yeah I, I, I'm actually I'm, I'm on pins and needles to figure out how we can. That, those data sets are going to be valuable. Um, well, listen, Tim, this was a fantastic conversation. Thanks for being my last guest of 2019. And. A fitting one. We use Carta all the time. We love the company. We've had a great partnership with Carta. We uh, we would really recommend it to any any founders out there, particularly uh, once funded. Makes your life so much easier. It makes our life easier. And um, thanks for coming in. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate right. it. Thanks, Tim. That's a wrap on this episode of The Medium Rules with Alan Baldishin. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.